Hey everybody, this is Jason from Outcast Haven. Today I'm speaking with Kale McCreeth, one of the top flesh and blood players in the world, but more importantly, an awesome person. Hope you enjoy. I think it's about eight stores within like a 25 minute drive. So what? So like every day of the week, you know, there's something on. What so. What part of New Zealand are you in? Uh, we're in Auckland. So you're in Auckland. So you're kind of in the hub of everything. Yeah. So my, um, where I live is about a 10 minute drive from the LSS studio. Okay, good. So, so like, we'll, uh, we'll start with that because that's a great place to start. <laughs> so the first time... It, and we met playing in a tournament a while ago and you smashed my face in, in a, in a guardian mirror. And the first time I'd seen you was when we first got in the game, us, me and our buddies here, we saw you do the developer challenge and yeah. how did you get invited to do that? Or how did that transpire? Um, so basically, uh, I think when I was asked to go in for that, it was about six weeks after the game had been uh, released. Okay. Um, I've known uh, James and uh, some of the uh, developers, like uh, Jason and Chris, for uh, quite a long time. Okay. So, you know, they'd seen, um, we got into the game very early on, and, you know, I was one of the first to go out and get the uh, the foil deck and, you know, started putting up a couple of results locally. And, you know, it just come off a uh, top four at the calling in Sydney. Okay. Um, oh, so you so went out to Australia. Had, had to, cool. I'll, maybe, I'll go anyway. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's um, you know, a couple of results. Um, they mentioned something about um, my name was one of the ones that kept getting searched up. You know, so they invited me in, thought it would make uh, good content. And yeah, uh, unfortunate to lose, but uh, you know, it was a good experience. That, that, but that turn that he pulled off was... Uh, it was actually insane and disgusting what he did with the getting all those barraging beatdowns in one in one hand was pretty sick. Yeah, so I I was aware that was coming. Um, <laughs> that's why we had the uh, crippling there, but I wasn't banking on the fact that I'd draw an unmovable and be left with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so <right. laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, if he had um, intimidated any other card in that game, I win. So <laughs> it's a bit um, you know, because yeah, that's was... like playing wizard. Yeah, it, uh, here's the other thing funny I noticed about that video is when you watch the video, when Ian comes on and starts introducing, he's got all this excitement and Jason Chung looks like he doesn't even want to be sitting next to him. He's like, what, why are you so loud? It's real. I don't know if you noticed that if you watch that video, the beginning of it, but it's kind of funny. Oh, I put that down to a bit of the, uh, the Kiwi humor. Like, um, and we're I very thought that. <laughs> yeah, we're very awkward, funny. You know, like um, we try and be a bit standoffish, but you know, it, it doesn't it, really work. It came off like that, and it was classic. I'm like, because I kind of, I'm like, there's no way that that wasn't kind of set up to be like that. And I enjoyed that part of it just because of how like loud and boisterous Ian comes on, and Jason Chunks just kind of held back. Is it, yeah, it was very good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ian's a bit of a character. He always comes on a bit strong, you know, really nice guy. Yeah, yeah, he seems like a very nice guy. So you're kind of, so for us on this side of the, the ocean, it's hard to imagine all the playing you're getting. So how many times a week do you think you play right now? Uh, so... I'm playing two to three times a week. Um, you know, I go on um, Tuesday and Thursday night after work and then maybe a Sunday. Um, if there's a big event on, I'll change one of those days for the sun of the, uh, the event. Okay. But um, if I wanted to, I could be playing six days a week and it's all within 20 minutes. That's insane. That's so when you're on your typical nights, how many games do you think you get in, uh, in a, in a typical night for, and are they like armory events or what type of events are you usually playing in? Yeah. So they're all, um, run as armory events, but due to the numbers that we're getting, we got, we've gone from four rounds to five at a lot of stores. So, you know, I can be playing five rounds a night, um, eight rounds on a Saturday or Sunday. 
Like it's um it's really insane. No matter where you go in Auckland at the moment, or I think you know Auckland, Wellington, main cities in New Zealand, like you're getting twenty, thirty plus people every armory event. Wow. You know, when Magic was at its peak, we weren't even getting that. That's crazy. So did did you play Magic prior to to getting into Flesh and Blood? Yeah, I did. Um, you'll find a lot of um, New Zealand uh, players. Um, probably came from Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh or something like that. Okay. But um, because we're so far away from anywhere else in the rest of the world, it makes it really hard to take that name and go pro. Um, you would have heard about the uh, Pro Tour and things like that. Right, right. But, um, you know, there's a couple that have gone there and um, done really well. Um, you know, Jason Chung is one of them. Uh, he's got a Pro Tour top eight. So, you know, there is a lot of really gifted uh, card players here. But we're just too far away from anybody. <laughs> Well, it's you guys are sh- definitely shining right now with uh, all the play that's coming out of New Zealand for this. What? Um, so, how long ago was your? Because you did a top, you topped one of the big events right away, didn't you? Didn't you take first in one of the bigger ones right away? Yeah. So um, there was a time in this game when uh, Matt Rogers wasn't uh, dominating everything, <laughs> and uh, I, I tend to uh, keep doing okay um, until he got good. <laughs> and then I kind of stopped doing so well. But uh, no, it's um, very early on, you know, part of growing the game. Uh, I found the game really easy to pick up. And I guess it's just a case of uh, players have caught up, you know, and it's, um, yeah, it's just showing that um, bigger community, uh, more skilled players, you know, the uh, the results get harder to um, to get. You know, so. And with... With you doing these weeklies, do you? I I know you're you're known for your Bravo deck, but we've discussed other decks uh, many times. Do you have any other decks, or do you do you choose to play different decks on these weekly events, or do you stick with Guardian? Um, if I want to win, um, I'll play Guardian. Uh, for some reason, I just seem to perform a lot better with that deck. Okay, but I can play every other deck. Like in the last um, month, I've turned up and gone like 3-1 with a Cavdane or gone 4-0 with a defensive Runeblade deck. You know, I can play a Wizard, I can play Ira. Like, I developed an aggro Ira deck and took to some tournament and came forth or something. Like, okay. it's, um, I, can, I can play everything, but, you know, just Guardian just really is the one I like to play. And that, that's your favorite, that's your most enjoyable deck to play? Yeah, just something about um, letting your opponent do everything they can and then crushing them when they got nothing left just, you know, it feels really good. <laughs> Yeah, that, and uh, I know we had talked about this. I played your newest uh, Blitz deck, and I completely trashed it the first time playing it because I didn't play it right. <laughs> and uh, yeah. but it's hard. So that's the hard part with, when I play Guardian is I want to do those big with the towering tight and i saw it i'm like i'm just i can afford it i'm putting it out there i want to have a 17 18 swing and i know that's not how that deck was meant to be played but still it was just uh it, it, it was just sitting there the fruit was sitting there and i had to take it but that leads me into your deck building because you have shared a lot of decks with me and how do you start your process with building a deck um Basically, I look at what the format is doing currently, um, and I try and poke a hole um, somewhere. So back when I came up with that um, version of Guardian that you were talking about with the, uh, the emerging dominance, I was uh, finding that I couldn't beat the uh, the Ira control deck. You know, they ran a lot of uh, defense reactions. Um, you know, you can't take uh, three to six damage to crippling them when they're just going to defend with two reactions and take three. Right. You know, you end up losing too much um, damage. Um, so I, I looked at that deck and I was like, well, how do I beat that deck? Um, and I noticed their play pattern was always, you know, picture blue, attack for one, and attack for two, and then attack with a third attack for like four to six damage. So I found that when I was blocking that damage, I was blocking with one card on the uh, the attack for two, and then two, card, two cards on the attack for four. So... I would take one damage and defend with three cards, and then I would attack back with one card, and they would defend and take one. So we were trading one damage for one damage, but I was losing three cards. They were losing two effectively. Okay. So looking at that, it's like, well, how can I exploit that to actually push damage through? Yeah, because the the most that an Ira player can block is um, 12 in one turn, you know, defense reaction in hand, defense reaction in the arsenal, and their equipment. 
So I was looking at emerging dominance and I was like, well, that's 14 with dominate on a two card hand. So it's like, I can take three, but I know that I'm going to push two, two to three, maybe six back. Then it was a case of just trying to work out how to do that. You know, you, you have like the better equipment density and, you know, I was trying everything from potion of strength and, you know, but basically I came up with a plan that if you can line up the emerging dominance and crippling three times in the game, you win. So okay, uh, basically it was just um, put that together and just um, every time you've got the emerging dominance in the arsenal and you draw the crippling, I just defend with two cards and take three, knowing I was going to push six back. Okay. So when you're playing that remembrance in, are you just waiting till you have both of those in the arsenal or into your uh, into your drop and then pulling them back out immediately? Or do, is that kind of what you're doing with the remembrance to get it the third uh, the time? Remembrance, I only really want to use remembrance when I'm down to like the last third of the deck. Okay. Um, you know, you need to make sure that you're getting like um, two emerging dominance and a crippling or okay. you know, like two crippling and a dominance back. You, you're just trying to line it up but Yep. You know, it, it does make the matchup um, pretty even, but you can still get blown out by something stupid like a Command and Conquer. Okay, yep, yep, I can see that. So then when you are when you build this, do you have a, like a set of testing partners? Do you have people that you specifically test with then when you're doing these builds? Or do you play solitaire with yourself? Or how do you, how do you test your, your builds? Uh, to be completely honest, mate, I've been doing like no play testing apart from outside of my, uh, you know, armory events. I've, I've just had way too much going on at work. <laughs> so basically, but, you're doing these in your head and then just running with them in, in your your little your, your local uh, armory events. Yeah, like um, basically, what I do is I pinpoint when a uh, big tournament is coming up. And I'm like, well, I've got this many nights to come up with something. And after each game, I try and write down, you know, something mentally that I can uh, do to improve on. And then I'll just try it out the next night. Like, that's really the only testing I'm getting done. Okay. Like, um, I'm, I'm working bloody 60 hours a week and, you know, I've got fam family issues and i got kids and a partner that needs attention. You know, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is just one little, little the, the enjoyment you get at the end of the day is to, to go play some cards with your friends. I know, I know oh, no, how that the can... enjoyment is coming home to the family. <laughs> yes. say that hey, partners listening. <laughs> <laughs> that that makes sense. Yeah. I, I I will say I have a fifteen year old son and I play Force of Will because he enjoys playing that card game with me. So we get together and we do a ton of games playing Force of Will and uh we go to to locals with that because they're still running those here. But yeah, I, I, I see that. Yeah. That, that's why I play that game in this game. This game is my game I enjoy more, but my son likes the other one, so I'm going to play it because I like playing with him. So I 100% agree yeah. with that. Uh, it's still cheaper than uh, anything else that the kids could be doing at that age, though. Eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when this game came out, and you said you've you've known Jason and James, did you guys have any inclination of where it would go? to this extreme um oh that's a bit interesting like uh, i've known james uh personally since i was about 14 years old my uh, first ever tournament was ran by him um now i wasn't a uh, a well-behaved kid growing up i was quite uh you know, <laughs> up and down all over the place but um you know he kept me um playing different card games and you know it just gave me something to focus on which probably kept me out of a lot of trouble but um i had like i knew about six or seven years ago he was working on something but i hadn't heard anything more of it and it just kind of slipped out of my mind like i just you know i was in a game store about a year and a half ago and i just seen this um our new kiwi game flesh and blood and to be completely honest i just didn't even think anything of it i you know i was about to walk out of the store when i got asked if i was coming in for the learn to play and just out of curiosity i was like oh who's made the game and I was just assuming it was just going to be like some random like Yu-Gi-Oh player or something. <laughs> but um, when they said it was James, I thought, oh, shit, I better, uh, better take a look. <laughs> um, you know, because not many people know, but when you meet that guy, like he's one of the most intelligent people you'll ever meet. Like, you know, he's the, you know, the, uh, the thought process behind it. I thought, it, you know, I'd have to take a look. So sure enough, I, um, I went in for the learn to play and, you know, I was just blown away. You know, he started telling me about a few more things that were going to happen. Yeah, the rest is history. I just got bloody hooked. That's that's insane. So 
with this growth, how does that affect? So here, I know for us, product is, has been up and down. Have you guys had that issue over there, or does it seem like the product has always been there for you guys? Um, up until about like I think three months ago, we could always get product. Okay. Um, I think Alpha Investments did like a video, and just everything went stupid. <laughs> like our player numbers were steadily growing, but it's like supply for product just like went stupid overnight. Like I don't know how else to put it, but um, I think there's a bigger misconception at the moment that it's all um, investors and whatnot. But I really think it's um, I know quite a few investors myself that have uh, been buying into the game, but they're actually playing the game. Right. You know, I think. There's also a lot of negativity at the moment because of the COVID issues with the um, product. Like you can't get much product printed because of the uh, short staff at Karamande or whatever. But you know, it's um anyone that's playing the game is wanting to buy product, which is a good thing for the company. So it's you know it's just awkward timing, but a fantastic game. So yeah, it, it's and the really, product's there; it gets bought. Yeah, it's really weird just to be in the place it's at where. It's ultra popular, but at the same time, we need a ton of product because I know I'm excited for Monarch, and and that's my next question. Do you guys have? Do you have any? What do you think Monarch's going to be? Do you have any idea of what what you think will change with it? Um, look, the guys have been really tight lipped about it, um, but they've been very open that the. Uh, the game engine or pitch system or something is not complete until Monarch comes out. The fact that um, they kept telling us that um, WTR was only the uh, the release and Arcane kind of opened up to the other side. You know, they, they've delivered everything so far and I think Monarch is the one set that they're truly excited about because we're finally going to get the full game. I mean, it's not like it's already complicated enough already. But, Right. You know, the fact they're this excited about it, like it's more excited than I've seen them about any of the last two sets. Okay. So, but you have no no guesses or or anything like that of what you think it may be. No, no clue. <laughs> I wish I knew because then I could start like you know buying up some of the cards. I think would be good or something. But uh, D- does it? Yeah. Uh, knowing James, it could be anything. Like. <laughs> Do you think uh, they'll release spoilers a little bit earlier than they normally would just because they pushed it back? Or do you think we'll still have to wait till sometime in April to start getting a little hint of things? Um, I don't actually know, but my assumption would be that it was only pushed back because of the, uh, the issues with COVID and getting uh, the product printed. But um, I do think there'll be uh, spoilers. Um, I think we may get some at the calling. That's like a week or two away. Um, I remember the calling in Auckland in February, we got um, spoilers for Arcane Rising that didn't release until April. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was like um, a couple of spoilers that come out then. Okay. Yeah, I, I would. that would be great. I mean, we would love to see that. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm super excited for it. I know our group is, We that's all we've been talking. I think the whole community that's out, everybody's been talking about is uh, the release of Monarch. So your next, yeah, I think, yep, go ahead. Yeah, I think they've actually given us a couple of spoilers for the last set. Like, um, we got copper tokens, um, you know, and they're saying something about um, you can cash in like uh, four copper or one gold or something. I can't remember the card. I think it was cash in. Okay. But um, yeah, something tells me that we're going to end up getting some form of um, system where we're going to be using money as long as well as pitch. So. Okay. It, it's going to make things very interesting having to count resources on two fronts. Yeah, and and just the way that cash in works with getting the extra cards, maybe then it puts lower intellect characters into the fold. Maybe I don't know. Maybe that's how data all becomes good. <laughs> yeah, now, it's, you know they they tend to do things for a reason. Um, you know, you look at cards like um, Chains of Eminence that came out in Arcane Rising, and we only really seen it get played here last weekend. You're looking at cards like Cash In and Snag, and there's no obvious place for them yet. Right. But, um, you just know that when the uh, time comes, those cards are going to be huge. Right. So it's just that slow build up to things it will be fun. So what? Yeah. So the next. So the calling. How far out? That's a couple of weeks out. In is that? Uh, uh, that's Blitz, correct? 
Yeah, so it's Blitz format. Um, I think where it's on the 28th, so like 10 days away or something, seven days. Okay. Jeez, I'm so bad with time at the moment. <laughs> but yeah, they, it's going to be um, really hectic here. Like um, the event is already sold out to capacity, um, which is insane for like a uh, population how small to have over 140 people at a tournament. That's um, That's awesome. Yeah, even Magic Nationals, I think we got like 119 people or something. So the fact that this game's not even two years old and we're doing that is really impressive. But having to go play 11 rounds and come out with a 9-2 record with the, with the amount of like really good players we have is going to be insane. Like, I think um, we may even see like not a single known player could even t- like could top that top eight that event. Like, you can't go 9-2 in a format this competitive. Do you, is there any surprises that you think may pop up in this one? I mean, is this one where maybe a rune blade comes out of nowhere and in, in, in top eights it, or do you think that's just not going to happen? Um, oh, look, I think, uh, whatever deck you turn up with to this calling, you have to be able to beat wizard because wizard is the best deck in blitz. Okay. Like wizard's worst matchup is wizard. There's no other deck <laughs> that I know of that has a positive matchup against it. You know, you'll get a few people talk about Brute, how they'll get that lucky four Intimidate. Like, that's never really going to matter. Like, right. A decent wizard player just kills you. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, it's, I mean, it's you, a fun you have deck to, to be play. able to beat wizard. Right. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So do you, will you, have you decided on your deck for it yet or aren't you to that point yet? Oh, I don't think it's a secret that I'm going to end up on Guardian. Uh, <laughs> it's probably, it's the only deck I've found where it's 50-50 with Wizard. Which to me, that's a really same. good to, to be at that point. Yeah. I, look, I just want like the uh, the most popular deck that all the good players will be on, or most of the good players will be on. I just want to know that at 50-50, I can try and leverage my skill and experience with a deck. Like, okay. The fact is, I can be the better player and still get beaten by that deck. So, nine two is going to be extremely tough. Right, and I think that's that's odd in this game because that I I'd made this point once before that if you had given me Matt Rogers dash deck at your your big calling that you had for constructed, I would not even have. I might have got a win or two, but I would not have topped eight with it because of the skill cap that this game brings. So the fact that you're saying even a lesser player could probably win with Wizard just shows you how strong of a deck that is. Yeah, I, I, look, to be completely honest, I think it is the best deck at the moment. Um, but I do think there is a lot of decks that haven't been discovered. And I put that down to the uh, complexity of the game. Like, if you think about it on a basic level, like every player is playing with four cards a turn, or maybe five if you count the arsenal, and they're trading, you know, three cards into four damage or something. But when you get players start, you know, putting a potion down and setting up big plays, you know, that's where things can get really hectic. And I think the players that play the decks that can do that better have got a better chance of uh, surprising the field. Okay. And, you know, decks like um, Poor Brute or, you know, Agro Viscerai or, you know, decks like that, I think can be good, but just no one's put the time into them yet. No one's discovered anything with them. So I think, it, you know, maybe one of those decks does just destroy, you know, Wizard and change the whole format. Which would be, it's kind of funny when that happens is when one deck can beat a deck, it will change the whole format, just like you said, and you never know what will pop up then as soon as that Wizard is taken out. And I've tried yeah, Runeblade a couple times. That to me, that's one of the harder decks to just to play in general. Yeah. So we had a uh, tournament here, um, I think two weeks ago at Mighty Oak. I think there was eighteen Ira players. Um, at the time, the uh, Ira was the best deck, and not a single copy made it into the top eight. Oh. So you know that's uh, all of a sudden when uh, Ira took a downhill step and um, Wizard stepped up. But um, when Ira was dominating the format, I was playing a uh, defensive one-turn kill Runeblade deck, and it was just winning every time I sat down against Ira, but it cannot beat Wizard. Okay. And is that just because of, of Arcane Barrier, or because of you just don't run enough blue pitch, or just is this period a bad matchup? 
Um, it comes down to pressure. Like, if you can't pressure the wizard player, they can happily take three damage in a turn. Right. Um, but if you give wizard, you know, a four card hand, they can easily just go like um, stir four for like fourteen, and then blazing aether for like eleven. Yep. You know, and even if you've got four blues, you can prevent what like eight damage or something. Right. You just can't give them that, that much time. Yep. And I've noticed that I've been playing wizard for a while, especially in blitz, and you just learn to to set up for that turn and then just hit with it. And if you hit with it, you're going to win on the next turn. And it's the to me, it's the only deck, Wizard's the only deck that I know when I can win. So I can look at what yeah. they have, what they have for Arcane, and with the boots, and be like, oh, I just win next turn. It doesn't matter what they do. Yeah, well, people seem to think, you know, Kano starting with uh, five less life is, you know, a downside. But when they're starting with an extra two turns, it's pretty, uh, <laughs> it, it can be rough. Yeah, know? yeah. So I want to uh, switch in, switch gears here. So I see on your Facebook, you're a big, uh, big rugby guy. <laughs> uh, used to be. More of a beer guy now. More of a beer guy. So did you did you used to play rugby? Because I see you, you know, you're, you're you're complaining or happy about certain teams. Is that uh, is that your sport? <laughs> yeah. I oh, mate, if, if you're like a male aged five and over in New Zealand, you're a big rugby fan. <laughs> if not, you're not really a New Zealander. So. <laughs> so did you play that growing up? Then was that the the sport of choice? Uh, yeah, right up until I was about eighteen. Okay. How many uh, how many broken bones from that that sport did you or did you go out unscathed? Oh, oh a couple, <laughs> you know. But it's all part of the fun. I mean, if you get a broken ankle or something, you can you know say, oh yeah, you know, did this mean run, got hit off or whatever. You know, it's just we don't complain about it. We just <laughs> let it heal up and get back into it. It's like uh, I'm I'm in Minnesota, so I'm on the Canadian border essentially, and. Uh, I don't, I'm eight hours from the Canadian border, but Minnesota, right, right on the Canada border, uh, hockey is huge here. So it's, that's the sport here. My son plays, does not play it. He plays football and lacrosse, but that, uh, that rugby, I, we never got into it. I know some people that played it cause it has a little bit of popularity, uh, where you'll see it played at some of the big sports centers around here, but what a brutal sport. <laughs> yeah it's I, I guess it's pretty tough like um you know in america having um american football or gridiron or whatever you call it like yep. um it's basically a very similar game but um you know just add a few more rules add a bit more uh, padding you know make them uh, take a break every couple of minutes so uh, you know it's the same thing like the hits are brutal you've got to you've got to be fast you've got to be you know it's, um we d we don't get much uh, hockey here. Um, we do have like a national team, but you know, no one here really likes to go and uh, spend their winters at a uh, you know, ice ring when you could be watching somebody get tackled. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so if uh, if they ever did a big, huge tournament in America, would you uh, would you try to travel over here to to partake? Oh, look! Every four years they have the uh, the Rugby World Cup. And I think every year the All Blacks, the national rugby team, they do a um, game in America. Is it part of trying to expand the game there? Okay. But, um, yeah, if, if the occasion came up, I'd definitely go. Like, um, I was meant to be going to the uh, the World Cup in France in 2023. Oh, okay. But, um, I don't know how that will look with uh, COVID happening. Yeah, it'll be so, interesting because you know, like, um, I, I looked out of curiosity. I, I looked to see. I have no plans in traveling to New Zealand at the present time. But when with all the tournaments out there, I'm like, I'm just curious what New Zealand's guidelines are right now. It's like, if you're not a New Zealander, you ain't getting into the country. That's what I basically what I read. Oh look, I think um, due to COVID, we've got the uh, the luxury of being a small, isolated island. Effectively, yeah, like, we can control who comes in, who doesn't. So it's very easy to keep covid at bay here but when you've got like countries like the states that are linked to like other countries and you've got borders and, you know it's you know bigger population bigger risk yeah so has it been so you guys have been mask free and what two months without so you've had no issues to go out and play have you oh, oh look to be honest even when covid hit like we just stayed home for uh, three or four weeks um we got to 1800 cases total nationally i think and that was bad that was enough for the whole country to shut down 
But, um, you know, we're 5 million people, I think. So, you know, that in theory is not a big number. Right. But by isolating that, it's meant that we've been able to save every other industry from going bankrupt. And, you know, we shut the borders down straight away. And, you know, I think if we were any bigger, it would have been a lot harder to do. But, yeah. You know, if we go out in public and we see somebody with a mask on, we still look at them like, oh, that's a bit weird. You know, like, <laughs> to us, it, it's normal. Like, you know, we're seeing pictures of around the world and we just, you know, we're kind of dumbfounded by it. Like, we know it's there, but without being there, it just makes it hard to actually imagine. It It's, uh, it's you don't get used to putting a mask on or it's like forgetting it in your car, having to run back before you go into the store. But yeah, we we're masks everywhere. Now with, with, with youth sports, they're even, uh, they have to wear masks in our state. They have to wear masks even when they're playing. So my son plays lacrosse and so they're in training right now and he has to wear a mask while he's playing and it's, they, they don't like it very much. No, it'd make it hard to breathe. The fitness levels would have to go up. <laughs> well, hope so. Make them better eventually, but <laughs> yeah that's awesome so next big tournaments um the the calling you guys have um blitz and then do you know what is there stuff line do you have a a pretty steady stream of calling style tournaments lined up for the rest of the year uh so there's been no announcements yet um but i imagine um you know shortly after the calling or maybe even before they'll announce something else but i know that the plans that they had initially um, when the game first released, they had like everything laid out, like um, a world championship coming in like a certain time period. And they had many calling events lined up around the world, but you know, with COVID they've had to improvise. So I guess at the moment they're just taking it, you know, week by week. Right. Um, But yeah, like knowing James, he, he wants this game to be like highly competitive. He wants it to be big, like, so he will make it happen. Um, it's just a case of whether the world's going to hurry up and let it happen. Right. Would you foresee, do you think the, the first worlds that they hold may probably won't be till 2022, I would assume, just because with vaccine rollouts and all that good stuff. But I would yeah. imagine the first worlds will be in New Zealand. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think that? Um, oh, look, I, I think it would be a bit, um, you know, where it would be nice to have it here. I don't think it's practical. Just... Um, I think given the early stages of the game, I think many New Zealanders have benefited from the game. Yep. But I think it would be much um, much better for the game and globally if it was held somewhere like the States. Okay. Where you can actually get all the big collectors and investors there and they can actually get to meet the team. Right. And I think that would be more beneficial to the uh, longevity of the game. And we would expect to see you uh, at, at one of those events if it was in the States? Oh, if I can get into the country, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, nah, I've been a good boy. I've been a good boy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, nah, that's uh, so. look. I'd love to be able to um, head over for it. In fact, I'd go basically anywhere for it, and it wouldn't even matter how I did. Just you know, to get the holiday, you know, meet all the people I talk to online, and you know. absolutely, yeah. That's I mean, that's that's kind of one of my my the goals, dreams is that there is a world or there is a bigger event. And if it is in the States that we will get to meet all those people, because if it's in the States, it's almost 100%. I I will be there and the guys that I play with will be there. And, and if it's not much further out than that, I think I would try to go too. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Be be interesting to see. Before, um, before COVID happened, they did do a couple of, um, you know, like release calling events in the States. I think one of them got like 27 people or something like, and they gave away like a $10,000 first prize and like eight gold tunics. And you know, it was like, I think it was like two months after the game released or something. Like, yeah. I believe so that was I in do Texas. Know that, yeah. But um, the feedback that we've um, seen from that, like um, we see all the players that actually got to meet James and, you know, like they're, you know, they're excited. They're stoked. You know, they're big supporters of the game now. So I just think getting um more, more face-to-face time with um, the team would just be beneficial for everybody on that side of the world. Yeah, and just to play, I mean, I know we're all eager. I told you we, <clears throat> I went to a store today to play with a, uh, in and out. It was five to six people there. Never had six at once, but uh, and that was a little ways out of our major metropolitan area to go. But I know other areas of this country are starting to see bigger numbers at local events. <clears throat> just a matter of once we open up 
uh, how many we'll get at some of our bigger stores because I think it will really explode once once COVID's done and we can start opening up, especially especially around this area. Oh, with the amount of product that's being hidden in the states at the moment, how fast spread? Like, there's going to be players everywhere, and it will grow. Like, you know, you've only got to sit down and play the game for it to, you know, catch on. Oh, it's it's amazing. It was playing and even like a sealed event we did a little sealed did some packs and just doing that was fun just when you're building the decks right on the spot and try to make some broken combo to go for a kill it's just it's such a fun game yeah well i think as well like any game of fab like is winnable um the fact that like you know any four cards can effectively like block any four cards you know like there's no real oh i've got this like real super rare card that just wins the game there's none of that so you know you just don't get the uh, the feels bad factor that you get from other games no that's 100 percent. you don't have to worry about learning on well you can you can lose on turn two to wizard occasionally in blitz but <laughs> in your classic constructed game there's no turn to kill it's you can set up and have fun with the game so yeah i love it and i yeah. to me it's one of my favorite games for card games that i've ever played in in this short time that i've played it yeah well you know i've played almost every game you could think of um, that's been released here and you know every game you can pick out a flaw with and i think um that's the same with the uh, development team for this game like they they've got vast experience amongst many games and it's like they've just taken all the best aspects and looked at every bad aspect of every other game and they've just tried to put all the best together uh, in their uh, own unique way yeah, and I think they did a very good job of doing it because it, that was the other thing that I liked about this game is if you play like Magic or a type of game like that, this is so much different than the other games that even if you are playing another game, this supplements it in a way that it it's not like you're doing the same game twice, if you know what I mean. So if you played like Force of Will and Magic, you're basically playing the same game differently, where this is a completely different game than all of those. And if you're if you're new to the game or haven't played it and you're playing another major TCG, you can pick this up and start playing it and it's a different feel, it's a different tempo of a game, which I think is great. Yeah, I think um, it's really interesting um, that you pointed that out because if you look at other games like Magic, I mean, Magic is a game where you start building up your resources from turn one. It's like turn one, you have to do this. Turn two, you have to do this. It's like you're you can play 10 games and seven of them will start the exact same way, you know, and then five of those games that you win, you'll win the exact same way. That doesn't happen with flesh and blood, you know, and you can play Yu-Gi-Oh and sit down and not even get a turn. So, <laughs> I, I mean, those two, those two games seem uh, very fun, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you want, you want to play an interactive game, you know, in the flesh and blood, and then you want to actually sit down and have that interactive game, you know? I think it's um it's quite ironic that you know in 2020 when the world gets shut down, you know everything's gone online. People are like, no, nah, we want to play that game in the flesh and blood. So. Yep, it it is funny though that you say that because when I played today with people I've never played with before and just met, you're laughing and having fun, um, more than a lot of other games because you're not doing these huge wombo combo turns. It's just so back and forth. It, it is. You just you just have more fun with it. There's no negative play experience from playing this game. Oh, as the game gets more competitive and you lose to a small percentage play, you'll find that players do get a bit um, you know, salty like they do in every game. But <laughs> like, it, it doesn't it doesn't happen in this game at like um the learning and begin and like you know, media right. levels and, that. and that's what that's what makes the game good. I mean, people want to have a positive experience, and they do want that interaction. No, and I, so, I agree. Yeah. Once you get to a higher level, there's people that you just want to beat every time, and you don't beat them. Yeah, I I, I can understand that part of it too. Yeah, it's basically just uh, Matt Rogers and <laughs> everybody else. Oh, <laughs> uh, so is he? Uh, I, I saw a picture of you guys playing the other day. It was a little uh, Ira versus his. He, was he running Wizard and Blitz now? Is that what he's going to do? Oh, he, he'll try everything. But we we'll, were we'll waiting for the uh, the first round pairings to go off, and we just sat down and decided to have a bit of a um, you know, like a friendly game. And <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, the moment um, we start playing, just everybody's sitting there making it a bigger deal than it is. <laughs> but um, 
I was playing aggro Ira deck and you know just got nutted on. So, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, it's good. Like you know, he's one of the players that you can always learn something from playing. Um, you know, he'll, he'll never say that about anyone else. So, but uh, <laughs> you know, he's very good, very good. Yeah, and it must. I mean, that must be a huge. I don't know, advantage just to be around, I mean, with you there and Matt Rogers there and everybody else, I'm not going to go through everybody's name that's top, just to have that level of competition, it must make all of you better playing each other constantly. Uh, yeah, I'd think so. Um, I don't really want to commit and say, oh, yeah, by having all these like, known <laughs> players in Auckland, it makes us better than anybody because I think there's many good players out there. Um, there's a few uh, that I've played on um, online um, even from America, from you know Australia, they're very good players, but they, they're just not getting the recognition that we're getting because we have the uh, the events. But I think the um, the advantage that we had from getting the game early, I now think is gone. Um, I do think it's uh, a skill factor now. Yeah, I think it's like anything, people catch up. And I mean, your guys' games have been highly publicized. There's video on a lot of stuff. Um, and it just makes it makes it easier to catch up for somebody to watch it and start to see the lines. And now everybody's writing articles and it does make it easier that way. I think, like you said, to, to catch up a little bit, but you guys yeah, well, innovated we it. Had, we had to figure it out the hard way. Yes. Right? <laughs> so, you innovated yeah, it for um, sure. The, I think the, uh, the interesting thing there is you can ask any Auckland player in particular that was playing when um, the game came out. And we will all look back on the decks we played and the way we played, and we'll say that it was terrible. Like, it's, even then, when we thought we had it solved or we knew something, we've just learned so much since then. Like it's the thing with this game, there's just too many levels to it. Yeah, it. Uh, when we post our gameplay, we get reminded of how bad we are constantly because every little mistake <laughs> is pointed out, and it's like, come on. I know we make mistakes. Oh. You don't have to point out every single one. <laughs> oh, mate, I, I was like sitting there looking at my screen the other day. I was like, why are you putting remembrance in your arsenal on turn one? <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, man. I'm blind to like emerging dominance. I was like, no, people it are going to think the deck's bad. Oh, yeah. Like I said, I, uh, I, that's why I wanted to, uh, preface before I started playing that I will play this deck horribly the first time. Cause I, I, that, that's just the way I, I don't instantly grab a deck and do very well with it. It takes me a couple times playing it. And then this, so as I was getting through the first game, I'm like, Oh, I kind of think I know what he wants to do here. And I just did it reverse of what you did. I thought you wanted the crippling crush in the arsenal and then play it. Uh, out your uh, <clears throat> emerging dominance, so I did get it pulled off. I just did it reverse of what you were, your plan was when you built that deck, and then I won the second one because I wasn't stupid and played really bad like it did game one. <laughs> ah, I was watching that game against uh, Data Doll, and I was like, "Yeah, once Data Doll gets good, this might be a problem." <laughs> so you know, I think um. Like with anything in this game, just repetition and just really understanding what you're doing right. and what your opponent is trying to do. Like that's where you start to, um, you know, pick out the windows. So it's funny and you say that. Where you're meant to be attacking about Data Doll is it's really bad until it's good. Like if it hits perfectly, it can just flood the board and turn into something amazing. But then we've played it where he's missed every time, and it's just a horrible deck, and it just loses immediately. Yeah, no, I think. Um, Data Doll is suffering from the range factor at the moment. You know, both you can tell have that immense potential there. Yep. You can just feel like there are a couple of cards off. Yeah. So and, be... you know, here's hoping Monarch fixes that up. Yeah, yeah. I, I I love to see a very diverse meta. So if they come in, I've been trying to get Cheyenne to work and I'm hoping that they reprint a cheaper version of her, but I'm trying to get her to work with all the potions and then mix in some arcane stuff when people maybe not expecting it and aren't going to run arcane barrier to get some free shots in. So I'm playing around with that one. I, I want, I want her to work. I just haven't got too serious because she's so damn expensive to buy. Yeah. Look, I think, um, Shiana is one of those, um, cards that's only going to get better and see, yeah, the card pool gets bigger. I mean, you know, specialization cards are normally pretty good. So if you can run a deck full of them, it's going to do something. 
I, I will say the one game I had lined up with her where I went on three consecutive turns, I went crippling alpha alpha. So I went crippling crush and then, then the next turn alpha rampage and the next turn alpha rampage. I was like, fine, if you could do that every time, she'd be amazing. Oh, we had a, um, there's been a couple of decks around here that have been starting off the turn with a scarf or a scar into a snatch with go again into a um, slog as a regurgitating slog for like 14. <laughs> with it, with Cheyenne as the uh, running as a hero? The hero, yeah. yeah. Wow. You just play like the uh, the heart and cross strap and you play the uh, Goliath gauntlet and, you know, you play your potion of strengths down like. You know, there's so many ways to do like broken stuff, but it, it does require being able to take a bit more damage. And, right. You know, picking out the right window to do it. But yeah, there's plenty of busted things you can do in this game, but just people seem to be playing too tight still. Yeah, I, I've noticed that, and I think that's one thing that I like to do is when we do our Tuesday streams, is it allows us to have that freedom and just do stupid stuff, and then you accidentally will find good stuff when you're doing the stupid stuff. You know. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, to be honest, it's how I learn. <laughs> you know, I'll be sitting there in the game and I'll be like, oh, well, this is pretty bad if I do this and miss, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> you know, so, you know, sometimes it works out and you look like a genius and sometimes you just look like a bit of a scrub. Yeah, I, I like to say we, I look like an ass. I do, I do a good job of making myself look like an ass, so. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's all part of the fun. It is, it is. I enjoy it. Well, I won't uh, take up too much more of your time. I appreciate you you talking with us, and uh, it just it's awesome oh. to get a better feel of what's happening over there. And you're kind of on uh, ground zero over there with all the action and knowing all the people that made the game and been involved from the beginning. So it's really cool to talk to you about it. Yeah, no worries. Uh, likewise. Cool. Thank you, and uh, good luck in two weeks. Oh, cheers. I'll, I'll try and make it in, but I highly doubt it. <laughs> It'll be pretty competitive. All right. Name. How how come she's not in there? Because I've played against a couple of Kasai decks that are... May, is it just because she can't beat Wizard at all? I mean, because she seems like a good, good deck. Oh, don't get me wrong. It's a good deck, but... The problem with the game at the moment is due to the lack of innovation from players, like they're just playing what they know to be the best decks, that any time a new hero is released, like it's going to take time for them to be worked out. Okay. So I think Kasai is very good. Um, I think it's like Warrior that is meant to be slightly more go wide and apply more pressure. Yep. But I think people are still trying to play it too much like a Warrior deck, like a Dorinthia deck. Right. And that's not what it is. I mean, I no, I think Kasai is meant to be purely a hit and run style deck that wants to attack like three times a turn every turn. Yep, and I've played. I know Blake has made his that he's got it to the point that it it's like that that it's attacking two three times a turn and that that's hard to block all those. Yeah, but like, I think as well. Like, um, one thing players aren't really picking up on yet is how to pivot. You know, using their equipment or their life total as a resource to swing the momentum back. I think, um, you know, people try and do it, but they're doing it with like one or two cards and they're not committing to it properly. Okay. Um, it's one thing I found really tough with um, Guardian at first. Like I kept losing to Ninja and I had to work out how to swing the matchup around. Right. But like the moment you, you take like a mediocre hit of damage or you use your equipment and you uh, turn around and put them on the back foot, and all of a sudden, you've got more cards to play with and they have less, so you know, you're know you back in the driver's seat. Right. But if you get that wrong, it'll cost you the game, um, and that's normally every game. <laughs> but um, no, it's you know, it's just understanding the game, like knowing the matchup, knowing what they can do, um, knowing what you're prepared to take, and just working out how you can mitigate it. Yep, and then just it, – it is interesting because it, it takes a lot of reps to get to that point too is what I find. It's like, cause you don't see a lot of those lines with one or two gameplays. It takes 10, 15 sometimes to see a lot of that. It's, it's kind of like with guardian, you know, you can crush somebody with crippling crush. And it's like, yeah, you did four damage, but you don't actually get the benefit until the next turn when they only have one card to come back at you. Right. You know, your next hand is the one that actually pushes the damage. Yep. Like just getting that basic understanding, you know, it's like, um, 
it's if you've played like a lot of other card games, it's really counterintuitive because there's no card advantage, there's no real board presence. Is you know, it, it's hard that the actual resource and swing of the game is actually a momentum which you can't see, you can't right. put on paper. You know, so. but it is a hundred percent. You you lose it, you know it, and when you get it back, you know it. You're like yes. <laughs> That's a great yeah. feeling in that game. Yeah, and that's what makes you know the game enjoyable is the fact that you can swing momentum, you know, three or four times. You actually feel like you're in a fight. Yep. You know, it, um, it, you know, it's one of the only games where you actually all action from turn one, and you actually have to like grind your opponent down as opposed to like doing something stupid and just oh yeah, I got this cool card, I win. You know. And there's no worse feeling when you do six damage and they're like, yeah, I'm just gonna take it, and you're like. Oof da. Okay, this is gonna hurt oh. coming back the other way. It's like you, you get games where you'll take a massive hit and you'll go down to like two life or something. Like you'll take like ten damage and they'll they'll think, oh, I've got you on two. I'm winning the game. And then you kill them in the follow up turn. And they're like, oh, but you're on two. But you know they don't understand that you took that ten damage. You know for that reason. So, right. You know, there's, right. There's a whole lot of things with the game. That, right. You know, it may look close, but it really wasn't. <laughs> There's a reason no. that damage was taken, because I knew I was just going to yeah. win. Yeah, but I, also, one more thing about this game is you can actually leverage like a bluff more than you can in other games as well. Like you can, um, with Guardian, you can bluff a pummel every time and commit cards to it. And, you know, right. the one time you do have it, you can actually catch them out. And, you, know, you can bluff defense reactions. Or, you know, it's just... There's more to just the cards that you're playing. There's a lot of unseen um, aspects to this game. I, I played, when I was playing today, I played somebody that was playing Kasai into my wizard. And they their first one, I blocked nine. And yeah. it completely, they didn't understand it. Like, they swung on, mm-hmm. it didn't occur to them that I could completely shut down their whole turn by doing that. That somebody would overblock, you know what I mean? That yeah. that didn't so, occur to him. I do that quite a lot. Like um, you know, with Guardian in particular, you can block with three cards, but if you swing back for four, they'll block with one, but you're still getting one point of damage. Right. If I you know, if I take three damage but block with two cards and I attack back for six, I'm not pushing any damage. You know, by blocking with one more card, you're creating a four point life swing as opposed to blocking with two and creating a negative two. Right. Negative three. Right. So, there's so many different things, and none of it makes statistical sense in a traditional gameplay like style. No, it it's doesn't. Quite, it's quite uncanny the way they've designed the uh, game engine to be like this, but it works. Yeah, it's it, it is cool because it those little things that it takes you just figure out, and I mean, just like when we played, <laughs> when I joined that tournament was all. New Zealanders and Australians and then me and this is back I don't know August September is when I played that one and then I did the mirror with you and I think you had 20 life when you beat me because you went up with your sigils and I'm like holy buckets I thought I was not good but I thought I was okay at the game and it was like a huge eye opening like god I need to I need to get good I I am horrible at this game oh I think Look, uh, I wouldn't take that too personally. Um, <laughs> Guardian is the one deck that can actually do that. Right. Um, but to actually do that, you have to use your deck as a resource as, as opposed to your life. And I think what you were missing when you were blocking with um, crippling and stuff like that is you were actually taking away the threat density from your deck that could have punished me for doing that. Right. So I was quite comfortable using my um, light, my deck as a resource because I knew that I was just going to keep pushing. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Correct blocking and then picking the moment to like play an undominated crippling to make me block with my whole hand and then a dominated attack to push through. Like, you know, it's all things like that. That that there I think is one of the biggest takeaways I had with talking from you is the fact that I would dominate attacks too early and not take the cards from my opponent's hand instead of stripping them down putting a little through and then doing the dominate afterwards to get a bigger those two turns equals to a much bigger swing in momentum yeah so like the key thing for me like i was struggling around um arcane format and i was talking to james and he just told me to just read the character 
um, profile that they have on the uh, the website. He's like, just actually read it. Like, you know, this is how it wants to play. And he just said to play the deck to its strengths. And so I went through and I, I wasn't sure what he meant, but, you know, it's like, you know, you just keep defending, you pick your moment. And it even says sometimes it's right to not dominate. And it's only once you start doing that, you actually start to see the impact of what it does. But you don't see it that turn. You see it the turn after and the turn after that. Right, right. It just takes... And that, yeah, that that's interesting because that is 100% true that you don't always see what you're doing on that turn. And that's hard thing in a card game to get over because usually when you do something in a card game, you want to see that immediate effect and you don't see it in this game. Yeah. But no, you know, you restrict your opponent of resources and all of a sudden you've got this big hand that you can do something with it. It's so much better than just trading this, uh, like my block three for your four damage, I take one. Now trade my four attack into your block three, and then it's a case of who gets that lucky last damage. Like, you can actually set up and do things. Right. You know, it's People get blinded by certain cards and they overvalue them too much. You know, like I've had games where I've blocked with all three Crippling Crush, whatever, and I've never even played one and I've still won. Wow. Just because that's what you had to do at the time and. You just have to find another way to win that game. Yep. Like, I can't even tell you the last time I dominated a Crippling Crush or anything against a Wizard player. Like, I literally just pitched it to attack for four. Right, because if oh, you... six, sorry. Six. Right, so because if, if you do that, if you try to dominate a Crippling Crush, they're just going to win because you have nothing in your hand. Yeah, but even Crippling from the Arsenal, you've got to have like a... A four card hand to make sure that you don't get blown out. But right. When you're coming in for 11, they're either going, I'm going to block with all like four cards, or I'm just going to try and kill you. Like, right. So you can't give them that window. Yeah. And I haven't. Like I had a game. I haven't played. The only time I've played Wizard is in Wizard Mirror because none of nobody in my group plays Wizard except for me. And it would be nice. I wanted to try your build into wizard i just don't have anybody to play that that runs it right now i'll have to ask david yeah. to run it to, to try it into that yeah so against wizard like with guardian like um you just play the null rune four and you just every turn attack for six do you go you know, do you pull they, the sledge then yeah that's the only matchup that i play that card okay but even people don't understand why you use that it's like um against um Wizard, you have to keep pressure. Yep. You need to force them to block with two cards, or you need to go, okay, you're going to take three, but I'll take four, and you just need to be able to push at the right time. Right. So, like, by attacking with six, what you're doing is you're telling them, okay, I've got two resources floating. Do you want to, like, Kano into something and then pitch another card to push, like, two damage and then defend my attack? So I'll take two, you take nothing. But then in your turn, you do nothing, and then I get a four-card hand to come back at you. So what you actually end up doing is forcing them to block, and then they get to play at um, sorcery speed on their turn. Yep. So you'll block with um, one card and take like one damage, and then you attack back, and they have to block up, and then they're still doing nothing. So you're actually just restricting them and fatiguing them. Yep. And if they do do something, you know that you're going to block at least four, maybe six damage that turn. Right, right. So Guardian can actually fatigue Wizard and Blitz. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to try it. I'll have to get one of my, one of my friends to play it. Because I, I do want to try yeah. it into it. And I know, like I said, we're going to try to have an armory event in two weeks. And so I just want to play some different matchups and figure out what I'm going to run. I'll probably end yeah. up running Kano, but it would also be nice to come with a surprise and, and, run, a, and run a Guardian deck. Yeah, I think um, we should try and line it up one night where um, I get a game against David. So you guys, Guardian against Wizard at top level. Yeah, if you like, I said we. Do, it just depends on your schedule, obviously. But we do those live streams every Tuesday, and David's been able to hop on a couple here and there. If that doesn't work, we can just uh, figure out time that works. I'm pretty open to being up late like this. This is one forty three in the morning here, but weekend, oh, so it geez. doesn't doesn't bother <laughs> me any. So yeah, no, I I talk to David on like a nearly daily basis. On okay, a daily basis. But, uh, yeah, I, I find it tough to uh, line up a time with him sometimes, you know, his yeah. partner and their time zone's a bit different as well. 
Yeah, I uh, I've with, played him a couple times, and we have a Australian versus uh, USA chat that we set up with a bunch of them that we did from the oh, course. Yeah, so it's good because then we can throw things back and forth. 